Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Dwight Chapin, and I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for this afternoon. Today's economic issues are critical to managing the U.S.-China relationship. Since normalization, China has grown over four decades to become the world's second largest economy. Today, China is an engine of economic growth for the world, providing both markets for our goods and supplying consumer products to the world. That said, China's economic performance comes with issues which must be addressed. It is distorting international economic practices and raising serious concerns, such concerns as currency value manipulation, theft or extortion of intellectual property, limiting access to their domestic markets for some products, and many more. So managing the relationship with China in the economic realm is a major contemporary challenge and one which this panel will explore in detail. Dr. Kissinger, who we just heard, collected some real talent on his NSC staff back in the Nixon years. I fondly remember Al Haig, Larry Eagleburger, Winston Lord, Brent Scowcroft, Dick Solomon, and many others. Among that distinguished staff, there was a 27-year-old young man who coordinated foreign economic policy. This man would, over the next four decades, become, quote, the most widely quoted think tank economist in the world. How's that for distinguishing oneself? <laughs> Director of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, holder of multiple positions where he has provided distinguished service to our nation and to presidents of both parties. It's my great pleasure to introduce the moderator for the economic juggernaut panel, Fred Berkston. Fred? <laughs> Dory, thank you very much. Uh, also, for what you did not say, sometimes when people uh, introduce me as having been Henry's economic deputy, they go on to say, that's like being military advisor to the Pope. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hormats has the same uh, claim on his resume, so we both get that comment occasionally when we uh, uh, perform in the context of his eminence uh, who spoke just a few minutes ago. Um, this is a terrific panel to talk about the economic issues. Um, Barbara Franklin, to my immediate left, is president and CEO of Barbara Franklin Enterprises, her international consulting firm headquartered here in Washington that advises companies doing international business, especially in China. Uh, she was secretary of commerce in the George H.W. Bush administration and uh, made a historic trip to China in 1992 that I hope she'll tell us about, uh, which normalized commercial relations, getting rid of the Tiananmen sanctions, or at least a lot of them, that had impeded the evolution of the economic relationship up until that time. Uh, Barbara has a new book, which is going to be <laughs> formally released tomorrow, having to do with the role of women a matter of simple justice, and it will pay some tributes, I believe, to the Nixon administration. That's so, right. Barbara, it's great to have you with us today. Uh, on Barbara's left, and presumably he'll get here shortly, is uh, Hank Greenberg. Uh, Hank's already been referenced. Uh, he, of course, was the legendary CEO of AIG for a very long time, and we'll never know if history had been different if he'd still been at the helm three years later when all hell broke loose. Uh, he's now chairman and CEO of the CV Star Companies, and uh, since he's not here, I can say at the advanced age of 86, and you will see this if you don't know him, an enormous, continuing, vigorous participant in the whole range of public policy and business debates, uh, including with China. It's fair to say 
that he is perhaps the most senior American businessman, uh, having been involved in China, knowledgeable of China. Uh, he had been asked by uh, Zhu Rongji when he was in Shanghai to become uh, first chairman of the International Business Advisory Council to the mayor of Shanghai. He was later senior economic advisor to the Beijing government. He's been on the Hong Kong Chief Executive's Council of International Advisors and many, many other involvements with China over the years. So he'll bring us a wealth of experience from that standpoint. Uh, Bob Hormatz, uh, next uh, in, uh, in line, is now Under Secretary of State for Economic Affairs and some other things, but we think of him as economic, uh, Under Secretary for Economic Affairs. Bob is a rare triple threat. Uh, he's got a very long and very distinguished career in government. He was in previous incarnations Assistant Secretary of State, Deputy USTR, uh, and Senior Staff Member of the National Security Council in charge of economic issues, actually succeeding me when I left in that job, and Bob carried it on admirably. Bob was there during the period of the opening to China and was very involved in the staffing preparation for that and the follow-up to it uh, after the trip began and U.S.-China relations started to move back in uh, the direction that we've already discussed today. Our final panelist is my colleague at our Peterson Institute, Nick Lardy. The National Journal called him everybody's guru on China. I think that's a fair uh, uh, description on the economic side. Nick has a brand new book out we just released a few weeks ago on the outlook for the Chinese economy and particularly uh, rebalancing of its growth model, which Nick believes, and I think a growing number of people, including the Chinese government, believe is absolutely essential if China is to maintain its growth pattern going forward and to play a more uh, cooperative and integrated role with the world economy. Uh, Nick is our Anthony M. Solomon Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute. For those of you without long memories may not know that Anthony Solomon, then Under Secretary of the Treasury, was the man who negotiated the claims settlement with China in 1979 that was also a critical initial step in restoring uh, ties between the two countries. So uh, that's the panel. Uh, it's hard to beat. I look forward to hearing from all of them and we're going to have a, uh, an informal uh, discussion among the group and then open up to you. I see that. And I'm, going to, I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell Hank that I already introduced you as a legendary figure in American business, U.S.-China relations, and a score of other things. Keep going. <laughs> I also told him that Despite your youthful appearance, you were still extremely vigorous, active, and feisty as can be. So we'll hear lots of creative things from Hank, whose recent op-ed in the Wall Street Journal proposed a whole new initiative in U.S.-China economic relations that I hope he's going to tell us about today. So uh, with all that by way of introduction, um, the, the setting is very well known. We didn't hear too much from Zbig or Henry about the economic side of the relationship, but that's to be expected, and we'll try to fill in the gaps. Um, China was economically insignificant at the time of the Nixon trip. It was just not a factor in the world economy, didn't play much role, and uh, therefore, uh, understandably, they didn't talk much economics at that time. But, as Henry mentioned, uh, at least uh, tangentially in, in uh, talking so glowingly about Deng Xiaoping, um, the reforms that began only six years later led to the most spectacular development success in human history. There's no other way to characterize what has happened in China over these last uh, 35 years, and we'll talk about that a lot here today. Uh, China is already, in this relatively brief span of time, a global economic superpower, along with the United States. Um, it will again, thinking back in history, it will again be the world's largest economy in the near future, if it's not already, depends on what exchange rate you use to calculate. Um, and therefore, economic issues have now become central uh, to the overall U.S.-China relationship, but to the world economy as a whole. And so what I'm hoping is that we can frame today's discussion around two sets of questions. One is the two-dimensional relationship 
between the two countries on economics. The bilateral relationship, where there are lots of extant issues that we'll talk about, but also the country's respective roles in the world economy. Um, the U.S. and China are now the two biggest countries in the world in economic terms. Uh, they're going to be increasingly so as time progresses, whatever the specific relationship between their two GDPs. And so how they interact, work together or not, is crucial to the entire world economy. And therefore, the relationship goes far beyond the bilateral, important as it is, to look at their respective roles in the global scene. And when Henry referred to the initial Nixon discussions uh, with Chairman Mao, uh, and Henry stressed how what they wanted to devise right from the start was a vision of the country's global roles and bringing China into the global system. He was thinking more of security, but it now clearly applies to economics as well. So this discussion of the global roles of the two really does go back to the origin 40 years ago. We've all been involved in different dimensions of it. Sometimes the debate gets sidetracked, I think, too much in focusing on bilateral topics. And so we do want to engage today on the global roles of the two countries. So that's one set of questions, bilateral, global, how the two countries interact. In both dimensions, there are then the familiar question, challenges, and opportunities. We know that China offers huge potential, and indeed much of it already realized, for increased economic relationships and benefits for the two countries. We're also acutely aware of the problems, the challenges sometimes posed as threats that China raises for the U.S. economy, the U.S. labor force, U.S. business, whatever it may be. And so it's bilateral and global, challenges and opportunities, kind of a two-by-two two matrix, if you think of that in your head, and we'll try to put a few uh, thoughts in each of the cells of that matrix and then open it up to the question. Uh, to, to, the, uh, to the audience. So uh, let me just start out by putting a question to our esteemed panelists and ask them to give us their judgment on the aggregate balance, the overall balance between China as an opportunity for and as a challenge to the United States. And let's maybe start on the bilateral side and then work up to the global, though obviously I don't want to try to limit what each of you said. The question is really, how should we think about China as economic partner and competitor? And how does this economic dimension affect the overall bilateral relationship, which has been discussed heretofore in this panel, in this conference, and is so important? Let me start with Bob Hormatz. He's our sitting official. Uh, Bob, I ask you to give your thoughts on this. Then I will turn to Hank as kind of our senior business statesman. I'll turn to Nick for an academic or intellectual research input, and then to Barbara as the cleanup batter uh, to bring her enormous experience uh, in business and in government to this set of issues. Robert, start us off. Thanks, Fred. Let me uh, start out by um, giving one little note on the history of the relationship since you mentioned it, and I think it's useful uh, to recall the point you were making earlier, and that is that at the time, almost everything that was done from an economic point of view vis-a-vis -vis China, starting out with announcements of relaxation of trade and travel and uh, pledge to expedite visas, a whole range of these things, was really meant as a political signal. And there was very little expectation at the time of a dramatic uh, improvement or increase in investment or trade uh, or business exchanges. And going back in history, uh, I noted a memo that I was asked to do uh, right around that time with the late John Holdridge. And we were supposed to identify five issues that we needed to focus on. And Fred mentioned one of them. And very quickly, one was the resolution of outstanding claims by US citizens against China and Chinese citizens on assets frozen in the US, the so-called claims asset issue that Tony Solomon years later, only years later, resolved. Then was the quote question of most favored nation treatment. Then travel between the two countries, industrial and intellectual property protection. 
That was a problem then, it is a problem now. And the last is the expansion of mutual knowledge of what each country had to offer the other because American business had never really had any degree of engagement with China and, and vice versa. So this was really a very early process of, of identifying the kinds of, of bilateral issues. But the, uh, in addition to the bilateral ones, as, as Henry pointed out earlier, the goal was to integrate China into the global system, first from a political and security point of view, and then from an economic point of view, which took place somewhat later. And the interesting thing about this, and the, and the, the point that I think is useful to recall from that period, is that two leaders of China utilized the fact that they were required to undertake a number of changes internally to become part of the global system in another way, and that is they used the leverage of the requirement to conform to WTO rules and international rules to produce market-oriented change in China. And I think that is really one of the interesting things. It's not just they joined the WTO or Deng Xiaoping pursued this outward um, opening in order to get access to more markets. It was that they both realized that engagement in the global system could be leveraged internally in China to produce or accelerate market-oriented reforms. And, and I think that in the way we deal with problems today, one of the key points we ought to bear in mind is that there are a number of things that we, when we frame issues with the Chinese, should be asking them to do are things that many people in China who want reforms want to do anyway. And if we can frame what we're asking in, in, in terms of compliance with multilateral rules, but also uh, measures that not only comply with global rules, but also uh, support the reform process in China, that seems to me to be one of the, the key elements of how we deal with, the, with these multilateral issues is one of the bigger challenges. The second point is that China never really, as some people anticipated, wanted to destroy the market or the global system. Mao didn't want to be part of it, but when it got to Deng and Zhu Rongji and others, they did not set out to destroy it. They, became, they set out to become part of it. Uh, and this, I think, is also an important bit of history to, to recall. And the third is that we did not, for a period of time, look on our relationship as a zero-sum game. One of the worries I have now is that on both sides, there tends to be, uh, at least in some quarters, a notion that this competition is a zero-sum game when you get to American politics and Chinese politics. So I would, I would go to the final point, and that is, how do, we, how do we address these issues? It seems to me there are two key elements, one of which is to frame what we're asking China to do in ways that are consistent with the broader sets of norms of the global economic system, but also appeal to reformers in China, because it's not a monolith. I mean, there's state capitalism, but then there are pockets of China that are, that are very entrepreneurial. So how we frame these issues is important, Doing them, framing them in a multilateral context, but also in ways that appeal to reformers in China is, is I think, extremely important. And the other is that we do, we, we do not bilateralize all these issues. There are many other countries who share uh, the interests of the United States in improving uh, Chinese performance in terms of for instance, uh, export financing or its non-compliance with an agreement to government procurement agreement, its intellectual property uh, problems that it had, it had uh, during the early 70s, it still has today. This is violating the intellectual property of a lot of countries. This unlevel playing field where state enterprises get enormous benefits, but put them in a context, A, that's multilateral and not just US versus China, and put them in a context in which we appeal to reformers in China and develop allies in China, as opposed to a bilateral confrontation, uh, which is probably going to get us very little. If we do it the other way around, I think we have a chance of developing the relationship in a constructive way and also getting more results. 
Let me turn to Hank for his take on this set of questions. Uh, how do we think about it uh, in terms of uh, uh, challenges versus opportunities? And let me underline a point that Bob just made and ask others to comment on it through the course of the discussion today. Uh, Bob worried about thinking of the relationship in zero-sum terms and worried that many Americans are kind of talking in that direction. What about on the Chinese side? Um, I'm not a China scholar, Nick is, but some have told me that uh, there's no Chinese language equivalent of win-win. <laughs> and that many Chinese tend to think in zero-sum terms, and of course, that would be a killer for the same reason Bob suggested it might be in the United States. So uh, particularly those of you with business experience in China, I'm looking at Barbara as well as Hank, uh, tell us what you think about that, but give us your overall take. Dr. Greenberg. Well, first of all, um, I went to China first in 1975. Uh, it was, uh, uh, and I was curious, to begin with our company, C.V. Star Company, was founded in China in 1919. And so we, I had a more than a curious view about going to China. Uh, I believed then, in 1975, that you couldn't keep China out of the world trading system. You had a billion odd million people. They weren't going to be isolated indefinitely. When Henry went uh, with the president, it really was for political and strategic reasons. It wasn't for economic reasons. Uh, the economic came later. Uh, and it was very easy to see on my first trip uh, that there was a bottled up uh, intensity to do more economically. Because all the, the leaders had been on farms and dispersed during the Cultural Revolution, and they were just coming back, uh, uh, and uh, they wanted to do more than have the kind of lifestyle that they had been living the last five or six or seven years. Uh, on my very first trip, I arranged a reinsurance arrangement with the then People's Insurance Company. It was a, a tiny building off Tenement Square. Uh, but, the, but even then, some of the people working in that, in that uh, company had worked for Star, the founder of our company, uh, in Shanghai. So there was, there was an immediate connection. Uh, now, I've been back to China more than Henry has been. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and we travel together quite often uh, to China. Uh, but the progress each time I go to China um, is just enormous. But I think there are many things that you learn from the number of years I've been going to China. Don't preach to China. I mean, that's a mistake. Uh, and and don't, don't have public um, discussions. Don't, don't negotiate in the public domain. Talk to China privately <coughs> about issues, uh, not publicly. Uh, and don't expect them to, to agree with everything that you advocate. They, they are, after all, a 5,000-year-old society. Uh, uh, we weren't even a, a pimple at that time. We didn't exist. Uh, they have a long history. Uh, and that history has gone through the 5,000 years of evolution. So they do have some fundamental beliefs on some things. Not easy to change, but they, uh, every time you go to China, you see the development that's taken place. I, what, what China's accomplished since I first went there in 75 today has never been accomplished in the history of mankind. There's no question about that. I mean, the progress has just been enormous. Now, do we agree on everything? Of course not. We have differences of opinion on many things. Uh, uh, China, as, as was stated, is state capitalism. That can't last forever. State capitalism will become a, a very difficult thing for them uh, to maintain. And I think they know that, uh, because it's distorting the economy in China. So there's changes coming, and it's slow. Are there Differences of opinion within China? Of course. Uh, 
that just re finished report uh, by the World Bank that had a Chinese very top think tank part of it. That wouldn't have happened a number of years ago. Uh, and it was done obviously deliberately by one faction in China. Uh, I think that, you know, Bob saying that, you know, that there is uh, there's a desire to bring about change and more liberalizing events in China and life in China. There's one faction that would like to do that. There's another faction that very much <coughs> opposed to that. Um, that's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be very difficult. And, and that's, that's taking place in the, in the twilight of an administration uh, where the premier, and I believe it can say that, is, um, is in favor of that. But uh, there are many others who say they're going to go much slower than that. And it's not going to happen that quickly. That doesn't mean that they're going backwards in any sense. It means that they're going to continue to bring change more slowly uh, and not very rapidly, uh, maintain order. The most important thing in China is, is, is order, uh, political stability. They cannot afford, a billion, 300 million people cannot afford a nation uh, that is in turmoil economically. <clears throat> rather politically within the country. There are two other things that we don't seem to understand or want to, or want to understand it. When we talk about China, and, uh, and just recently the, um, the vice president who will be president has visited, uh, Xi, um, and, I, and he made an important, a couple of important points that I think we should listen to. When the Dalai Lama comes to the United States and visits the White House uh, on Tibet, most Americans think of Tibet as a small little country on a map. And that, you know, why are we being so not supportive uh, of that, of their demands and their wishes? Uh, Tibet accounts for about a third of China in Chinese eyes of what they what the Dalai Lama wants, because the language that they speak in Tibet is about a third of China. Well, there's no way that China is going to recognize that part of China as being part of Tibet. I mean, I mean, forget that. That's that's a line in the sand, and we shouldn't pursue that. It makes no sense. And then there's another major population center uh, that are Muslim. They're not going to dismember their country. Uh, and that's just not going to happen any more than if, if Mexico said Texas belongs to us. You know, we're really part of Mexico. Uh, no nation is going to be persuaded uh, by a foreign power that uh, they should recognize uh, some other uh, dimension as to how the country is, is put together. Uh, so let me stop there on this because we're going to go into yep. the more economic things in a little while. Right. Okay. Nick. Um, uh, thank you, Fred. Um, let me start out by saying that I certainly agree that in many respects China is a, an economic superpower, but I think there's also a risk that we, we, we make them a giant that they are not, and I think there's a lot of misperception uh, about their level of economic development and how much of a threat that they are, for example, to the United States. It gets to this uh, competitive uh, uh, cooperation uh, dilemma. If you look at China's GDP, it's huge because there are 1.3 uh, billion people. But if you look at per capita disposable income, that is after-tax income, and their personal income taxes in China are very low. So basically, we're, we're talking about the earning power in current expressed in dollars. In urban areas, which account for about half the population, it's $3,600 a year. And in rural areas, it's about $1,200 a year. Population's about 50-50, so you're looking at per capita incomes uh, of about $2,400. So when, you th when we describe China as the economic giant, remember the average, the average um, income is about $50 a week. 
This has an enormous effect, uh, at least on my thinking, about the nature of the cooperative or, or competitive relationship. I certainly would argue that we don't want to be competing head-to-head -head with people that are earning $50 a week. We will lose, for sure. So necessarily that means a lot of the labor-intensive production uh, we are, we're no longer competitive in. We're buying it from China, as everybody knows uh, who, who shops. Uh, at the high end, I think we're still very competitive, and there are a number of things we, do, we can do to maintain our competitiveness, but that's really a different discussion. So when you hear China's the second biggest economy in the world or the biggest economy in the world, $50 a week is what the average Chinese income is in U.S. dollars. Um, the second point I want to make is with respect to this win-win. I think many of you were here earlier this morning when uh, we heard from Yang Jiachi, the Chinese foreign minister. Uh, I don't think he's an outlier. He talked about the potential for a win-win relationship uh, between China and the United States. I think it's very much a part of their vocabulary. And certainly, I think in, in recent years, the foreign ministry in China has been bending over backward uh, to improve uh, and sustain the relationship with the United States. And I think uh, there is certainly an understanding, starting with Deng Xiaoping and concluding all the way through with, with Zhu Rongji, at least, that there was a very good understanding that opening up China to the global economy would be a win-win situation. I think that's been demonstrated uh, in spades. So I think there is a potential for win-win. I think we've been recognizing it. I think we've been achieving it. Uh, I think the Chinese certainly um, understand it. I do think, however, there's a risk that we portray China as being a threat with huge income and uh, taking away a lot of U.S. jobs and is going to be a major challenge to the United States. And in certain respects, of course, that is true, but I think it's easy to fall into the trap of overestimating uh, China's ability to compete uh, with the United States in purely economic terms. Barbara? From where I sit, this probably won't surprise you because I'm a former Commerce Secretary, but I see the economic relationship as, as literally the foundation of the bilateral relationship today. It didn't start out that way. But I think that's where it is now. And in your question, Fred, of the balance between opportunity and challenge. I definitely see opportunity that it's a $200 billion market for, for our companies that has, uh, we've just really start, started to realize there are going to be challenges when you have as big a relationship and as complex as it's gotten. When you consider now that China is, is a customer, is a supplier, a competitor, a partner, and the complexity has, has grown along with the size, and we're, we're just going to have disputes. And when you think of another example, Canada, our largest trading partner, we have huge amount of disputes with Canada. But somehow we, we manage through them quite well. We're going to have to follow that same pattern with, uh, with China even though it may be a little more difficult uh, b because their model is different to manage. But, but that's, going to be, uh, that's going to be the mission. Um, and growing this relationship is a win-win. I am convinced of it. I think the Chinese side is. I certainly know American businesses are. When you consider some of the companies that are really staking an awful lot of their future growth and profitability on that market, it's, it's astonishing to me just what has happened on that score over the last, uh, the last decade. Let me digress for a minute and tell you about uh, the, 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 uh, this is in the, the vein of growing the relationship. My mission in uh, 92 that, that uh, Fred mentioned. After June of 1989, there were eight sanctions placed on China by the U.S., and one of them banned high-level government-to-government contact. President Bush, this is H.W. Bush, of course, lost the election, but before we were going out of office, he really wanted that sanction removed because the, his idea was that the new administration, if there were a crisis with China, would have far more difficulty in resolving it with such a sanction in place. The vehicle to take away the sanction turned out to be me as Commerce Secretary, 
And the mission was to reconvene with my counterpart, the U.S.-China Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade, JCCT, which is still going on and which had been started by Mac Baldridge a few years earlier with his counterpart, but it had stopped, stalled, because of this particular sanction. And so we threw a mission together very, very uh, hastily in, uh, in the uh, post-election time of 92, we're not sure what we were going to get, uh, but went off to Beijing. There was a press story just as we were leaving calling the trip a boondoggle. And President Nixon called me. I had served in his White House. That was the, I was advancing women, working on his effort to advance women that Fred told you about. President Nixon called me and said, you're doing the right thing, uh, go. This is very important. Which led me to believe that President Nixon actually was, had been monitoring where the economic relationship was, was going and the fact that it had kind of gotten stalled. And that was reassuring. His call was reassuring. I asked him whether he had any advice. And he gave me one pithy one-liner. Don't slobber over him. <laughs> I knew exactly what he meant and tried very hard not to do that at the time I was there. Anyway, that trip, um, we brought back a billion dollars worth of signed contracts for American companies. The Chinese did deliver on some things, which sounds like not a lot, but at the time it was, and a lot more business flowed from it because the sanction was gone and a green light, in effect, had been given to American business that now it was okay to go to China to explore what you have been wanting to explore. Your government was in an approving state of mind, and that's what they did. And if you begin to see where the numbers went after that, uh, trade elevated, and so did foreign direct investment. Now, I, th I think I'm going to stop here, but I think we have, uh, we have really barely scratched the surface of the opportunities that, that are there. And one of the things, I think you'll get to this in another question, is where the playing field isn't level, that we would like some, uh, uh, some ability to help to level it so we can maximize opportunities. On the other hand, uh, we have an election coming here, too, and we have a little chance to reset things. I think one of the other maximizing <laughs> uh, abilities that I would like to see us have is, is for us to recognize that we need to be competitive. And that means some changes in public policy here in this country or some revisions, uh, namely getting at our debt deficit issues, revamping our tax code, Corporate tax rate is the second highest in the world here. We need, we need to pull that down. Uh, we, we need more innovation spurring or let's get rid of things that dampen innovation. That's always been a, a, one of our uh, competitive edges here. We have too much regulatory stuff that lands all over small business, which has been our innovation creator and our job creator, and our education system needs a little bit of help. So I, I see a, a double-edged sword here. In order to maximize the potential that I think there is in the China market, we need to do some things here at home, and we need to help our Chinese friends to change some things that would level the playing field. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's continue on that theme. I think it's fair to say all four of our panelists come down on balance in favor of opportunities Opportunity. relative to challenges. Uh, but, as Barbara just said, there are a lot of challenges. One response to that is doing things internally at home, as Barbara said. Obviously, we have a lot of problems internally, and maybe we get to those later. But let me try to have another round of comments on our specific problems with China, our economic difficulties with China. Uh, they come under numerous headings. Uh, trade policy issues, China's industrial policy, indigenous innovation policy, IPR problems, uh, the exchange rate has been an ongoing problem, China's holdings of dollars, will they in some way attack the dollar in the U.S. in that way? What about the need to rebalance the Chinese economy? The World Bank study that uh, Hank mentioned uh, emphasizes that along with its Chinese counterpart, as does Nick in his new book. Um, so let me ask each of you, which of the current problem areas do you see as most important, uh, defining problems here as mm -hmm. policies in China that may adversely affect the U.S., represent challenges or even threats, as it's sometimes put? Um, 
how would you prioritize those different questions? And Barbara, let me start with you. And particularly, given your background as Secretary of Commerce, in the, in the trade, industrial policy, uh, intellectual property, et cetera, complex, uh, how seriously do you rank those problems, and, and which would you put at the top of the list? Okay, let me just put, the, this is not going to be exhaustive, but let me put three on the list. And Bob mentioned that IPR <laughs> was one of the early issues. Well, it still is. Right. The rule regime is, is basically in place, and the state council, I think, has, has done some good work. It's the enforcement that's, uh, that's an issue, and perhaps it would be helpful if there were stiffer penalties using the WTO uh, criminalizing uh, agenda to, to uh, really get, hit those people who are counterfeiting. So I put IPR enforcement up there. I would put an open investment environment up there. And um, let me explain that a little bit. Our Chinese companies are actively looking for investment opportunities here. And we think we have an open investment environment. Well, what we would like is the same thing on the other side. And here is where the restrictions that are in place and in the latest catalog on foreign ownership which cuts across some 100 or more sectors uh, of both uh, goods and services. That, that is, uh, that is a, an, an issue for us. The other thing that would be helpful, that the, if there's a project that is going on in China that a company has, there, there are generally multiple chops, multiple approvals that are necessary, and the process for doing that is, is, is not at all transparent. And that just makes, uh, that just makes doing business harder. So that's my second one, has, having to do with, with uh, investment openness. And the third one um, is something I thought Bob was getting at a little bit. I'm, I'm calling it competition, but maybe there's a better uh, way to describe it. It, it. it has to do with the state-owned enterprises mainly, and the preferential treatment that they get in a lot of ways from the government, whether it's uh, financing, whether it's opportunity for faster licenses, uh, whether it's other kinds of resources, et cetera. Uh, we don't do that. It's not the way our system works. And that's, uh, that's, an, unlevel, that's an unlevel playing field. And these state-owned enterprises, I think a whole bunch of them now, maybe five, I've, I've forgotten the number, are on the Fortune 500 largest uh, companies in the world list. They're getting big, they have scale, they're getting good. So it's competition with our folks, not just in China, but around the world. Now we ought to hopefully be able to convince some of our Chinese colleagues to pull back from some of this so that the, the uh, playing field is a bit more level. Thank you, Barbara. Let me turn to, to Nick, and Nick particularly ask you about the macroeconomic, the monetary side. You've just written a new book about it. Um, how serious are those issues, both for the Chinese economy and for its role in the world and its relation with the United States? Well, this is, um, this is what the Chinese call and what other people, including myself, call the rebalancing agenda. And basically, this, the argument is very simple. The, the Chinese model for generating the very high rates of economic growth that we've seen over the last couple of decades, particularly the last decade, isn't likely to be very effective going forward. The, the investment rate, uh, investment as a share of GDP is in the stratosphere. It's higher than any other country uh, in the world at any period for which we have data. Consumption is very low. Uh, a lot of the investments going into relatively unproductive uh, investment in residential housing, that in turn is a function of some distortions in the financial system, negative real deposit rates, so households are piling into property, which seems to be a good, um, a good return, uh, a much better return than, than property. So the objective really is to move towards a method of growth in which private consumption expenditure becomes much, much more important uh, than it has been. In other words, rather than declining as a share of GDP as it has been doing, particularly since 2003, it should be rising. And 
that would that would help quite a bit in terms of China's external imbalances as well. Uh, they their surplus, their external surplus has come down quite a bit, but. Um, as we move forward over the next few years, it's quite likely the surplus will go up again if they're not successful in rebalancing. They need to reduce this extraordinarily high uh, level of savings, and one of the ways uh, for that to occur is for the household sector uh, to spend more. I think the, the methods for accomplishing this are fairly straightforward. I don't want to go into all the details, but they have been blocked in part by vested interests within China who are not interested in this rebalancing. There are a lot of a lot of sectors of the economy, a lot of regions of the economy, of certain bureaucracies that have benefited from the kind of imbalance growth strategy that has been followed, particularly since 2003, and they are loath to uh, give up this model of economic growth, which they have disproportionately benefited from. Uh, I, we were talking, I uh, heard some discussion at lunch and afterwards about the new generation of leaders. I think one of the key questions for them will be whether or not they are, will become reformers in the model of Zhu Rongji and are willing to take some political risks and force through some things uh, that are opposed by key segments uh, of the bureaucracy. We've seen over the last 10 years that uh, Wen Jiabao, the premier, has not been willing uh, to do that. When he hears conflicting advice from different quarters, the solution is do nothing. And the, the flawed system has... Uh, become even more uh, even more entrenched uh, over this period. So I think a key thing going forward is whether uh, the new group of leaders will be uh, more reform-minded, will really seriously tackle this rebalancing agenda. There are components of this agenda that have been in the 11th five-year plan, they're in the 12th five-year plan, but they're fought tooth and nail. And so actually very, very little has happened on the, on the, key, uh, on the key reforms. Uh, this would be very good for the United States. It would be very good for the global economy if, if China, uh, if domestic demand becomes more important, they will not uh, be such a big surplus country periodically. When, of course, when their surplus goes up, they're basically a drag on economic growth uh, in the rest of the world because they're, they're adding more to the supply in the rest of the world than they're, than they're adding demand to the rest of the world. So aggregate demand in the rest of the world slows down. This was a very big factor a few years ago. It's gotten smaller, but the risk is, uh, without a more serious uh, attempt at this rebalancing, that that kind of uh, negative effect on the global economy could reemerge over the next uh, two, three, or four years. Hank, with your enormous experience in all this, which are the most serious problems, uh, and how serious are they? Well, they're serious because we're always, you know, we're always having a. Uh, a negotiation that goes no place. <laughs> and uh, the progress that we make is very, very minor in comparison to the totality. Um, Carla Hills and I co-chair uh, some dialogues uh, with China on an annual basis. And we say to them the things that trouble us, American business, and they say to us the things that trouble them, we have a nice meal, and, uh, <laughs> and if you meet again six months later, we're saying the same thing. And that hardly is a, uh, is a, uh, a method of uh, getting progress. So it, it seemed to me uh, that, uh, and I said this at the, uh, at the last dialogue we had, uh, I think with the, with the chamber, and I think when you were... Um, you know, and there was a there was a just retired vice premier at that meeting, and some, and the heads of some of the SOEs, the large state-owned companies, uh, said, you know, this hardly makes any sense. Uh, what we're doing, we're, uh, we're not making any progress, and uh, and it gets to be bitter after a while. So why don't we think about um, starting to negotiate a free trade agreement between our two countries? Now, I'm not naive enough to believe that we're going to negotiate a free trade agreement, you know, in a, a couple of three years. It'll be a 10 or 12 year project. It took us seven years to get the Korean trade free, uh, uh, free trade agreement done. Uh, but what happens if you're negotiating? Uh, you'll solve some of the problems, you won't solve some others but you'll at least be engaged in something that's positive. 
uh, you will not be going away having accomplished nothing. And it should take place over a long period of time. At the end, you may never, never be concluded, but you'll have made progress during that period of time. And China will be, will be changing during that period of time as well. And so it seems to me that uh, we should give serious thought to that. I know the Chinese are considering that. And I've, I've tested that with them. And there is a serious side in China that, hey, that's not a bad way of, of going forward. Because what do we do now? We meet and we talk about the SOEs. They have privileges that make them uh, competing with, the, with us very difficult. It also starves other parts of their own economy. But you got to remember, China is still learning. It's like a, it's like a, a, a young person that's grown to be six feet tall in three or four years. They, the rest of them haven't caught up with their size. And so we need some patience in dealing with them. Uh, look, it took me from 1975 to 1992 to get the first insurance license ever granted to anybody in China, a foreigner. And we owned 100% of our company. No <laughs> other company ever got that. But it took patience, That's and true. it took a long time. And at the same time, you, you teach them something. You've got to give something back and not just look to what you can get out of China. That's the wrong approach. And so if, if, if we approach it on that basis, it'd be fine. I mean, Nick talked about the average, you know, making $50 a week. If we stopped importing certain things from China, it'll go someplace else. There are many other countries in the world uh, that will be glad to replace, whether it's textiles or other, or sneakers or whatever it may be. Uh, and so, you know, we can't believe that China is, you know, that's the only place in the world that we can, that we can get low price things from. That's not true. Not true at all. Hank, thank you. Uh, let me then ask Bob, who with his colleagues in the administration has been on this case now for three <laughs> years. Um, tell us what you've achieved. Tell us where your frustrations are, what your current agenda going forward looks like. And, and segue into what I had sort of suggested to be our next question that Hank has really already introduced, which is possible policy changes. Hank has, as always, put a big picture idea on the table, a U.S.-China free trade agreement. Um, I like it. I've supported it when he wrote it and has been talking about it for the last month or so um, with all the realistic uh, caveats that one has to put on that it would nevertheless be a way to break through a lot of the specific issues. Um, I suspect, Bob, you don't have a, an administration position to give us on that one, uh, but tell us how you see the policy results, the efforts of the last three years that you've been so intimately involved in, uh, along with your colleagues in the administration, and how you would pose the agenda going forward. Thanks. Well, I think there has been progress uh, in, in several areas, but... The problem I see is that the progress has not been rapid enough in light of the uh, size of our economies and in light of the need to resolve a great many issues to put our relationship on a more balanced footing. And, and uh, in many cases, you go to a meeting and you do make progress enough to say the meeting was a successful meeting, but not enough progress to fundamentally solve the problem. And this becomes more frustrating the longer this process lasts. So I do think we're going to have to uh, identify some areas of agreement where we can, that we can pursue to make somewhat bolder progress on at least a few issues in the course of the next several years. I think, in a way, there's an opportunity to do this because the point that Nick made a little while ago and that the World Bank paper made as well, the policies that enabled China to grow so rapidly over the last 40 years are almost certainly not the kind of policies that will enable China to achieve such spectacular results 
over the next 40. And therefore, I think Chinese, despite the vested interests that, that both Hank and Nick talked about, I think there are a number of Chinese who are thinking in bolder terms uh, and, and recognize that major changes have to take place. This may be a propitious moment for making bolder progress or encouraging the Chinese for their own domestic reasons to do a number of things in their own domestic interests that also serve our interests. So let me just identify a few of those. I think where we have made some progress, but not enough by any means, is a point that, that Barbara and I both emphasize, and that is intellectual property protection. This is a problem when Holder, John Holder and I wrote that first memo in the early 70s, it remains a problem. It, there have been some areas where the Chinese have improved on the protection of software, for instance. There has been an agreement now to take a much tougher view. It's now under the State Council. What was a six-month program will now be a multi-year program. In the area of indigenous innovation, which uh, the United States and virtually every other country that traded with China objected to, the Chinese have made some improvements at the national level, but not sufficient improvements at the provincial or the state-owned enterprise level. These are two examples where some progress has been made, but again, not enough and not uh, enough progress in, 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 in broad terms. So what, what should we be focusing on uh, for the future, and, and why should we be bolder, and why should the Chinese be bolder? Intellectual property. It remains a huge problem for us. The Chinese are fond of saying that they have core interests. The United States has core economic interests, and the core economic interest of the United States is that we are, don't compete on low-wage products, um, such as apparel, for instance, or a number of other things that Nick uh, underscored. We compete at the very high-end, innovative products of various sorts. And if we find that our innovative uh, technologies, our copyrights, our trade secrets are uh, pirated or there are forced transfers uh, to China, Chinese companies, or that as a precondition for investing, you have to give China, Chinese government authorities a lot of information on your product, and then it ends up in the hands of Chinese companies competing with us. That is a big problem for us because it affects our economic future. But having said that, Chinese are developing their own intellectual property, and they want more intellectual property protection. They also need to get more foreign investment into China. They want high-end investment because wages are going up. If they want that, they have to treat intellectual property with, with a great deal more respect, which means to say enforcing their laws. Barbara is exactly right. They have the laws. They just don't enforce them properly, if at all. And, and, and this, to me, is an area where there's a huge challenge it's a core interest, economic interest in the United States, but there's an opportunity. The WTO, China has benefited enormously from the WTO for reasons several of us have mentioned. But the problem is that China is very good at identifying gray areas that are not quite illegal under the WTO rules, but are inconsistent with its principles of non-discrimination and fairness. And they take advantage of these gray areas, of these gray areas and therefore, a full-throated support for the WTO and the global trading system would be very helpful. It would be helpful in terms of dealing with international tensions. It would also be helpful because Chinese companies are going to be, uh, as part of their going out strategy, playing a greater role, and they want respect for international trade rules abroad. The same applies to investment. Barbara made a very important point. There's a lot, there are a lot of areas where China has restricted access to investment in key sectors, many key sectors, as she pointed out. Now, why is that a problem? It's a problem because it gives Chinese companies the ability to develop economies of scale in China, which enables them in turn to export more competitively, and when they invest abroad, to be more competitive because they've made these big profits in China. Why is that important? It's obviously important for competitive reasons for us and other countries. It's also important because as part of the going out strategy, they want to have their companies have uh, access to other markets. If they have these discriminatory rules internally, there'll be much less acceptability of Chinese investments around the world. And the same is true with intellectual property. It's very hard to be accepting of a Chinese company investing here if there are accusations that it has uh, it has taken intellectual property from another company and is 
investing in the United States to sell those things um, in this country. And let me just go back to the, the state-owned enterprise model or state-supported enterprise model, for instance, for a, a second. There's a little confusion, I think, in, 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 in China and also to, in this country about what the position of the administration is and why. We have no objection if China wants to have state-owned enterprises. In fact, there are a lot, there's a lot of evidence that they are sucking up a lot of capital and hurting Chinese private sector enterprises and particularly state, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises and are hurting China. So I think there's going to be a major reevaluation of this. There's probably a lot of resistance to change by vested interests, but there's going to be, uh, I think, more and more reevaluation in China uh, uh, on, on this score. So I think on state-owned enterprises, our concern is not so much that China has them, because I think there'll be pressures that will grow in China to, uh, to reduce their size or reduce government support for them. Our concern is that many of them get inordinate amounts of government support, either export uh, support or domestic uh, very liberal uh, loans from the government or grants from the government. They get exemptions from antitrust law. They get factor, subsidized factor inputs, energy and land, for instance, which gives them an artificial advantage in the global system. So these are areas in virtually each one of these areas where we have problems with the Chinese. I can make a very strong argument that China, as part of the rebalancing internally and part of its desire to address its issues, for instance, environmental issues, needs to make changes internally for its own purposes. And many of those changes, I think, will be helpful to us as well. For instance, during Xi Jinping's visit here, China announced that it was lowering taxes uh, in order to boost consumption. They didn't do it for us, but it will help the rebalancing process. So I think in this reevaluating period that the, that the Chinese will undergo, there are real opportunities to work with China to encourage them to do things internally for internal reasons that also are helpful to us. But also we have to be assertive where we find our interests are compromised like uh, intellectual property. But I think there is a way of doing this that's constructive. You can't, as Hank's pointed out, you can't lecture China and expect them to accept what you say just because we say it. But if you make the argument, if, if the narrative is one that is also helpful to certain interests or certain objectives in China, I think you do have a chance of making more progress and bolder progress. Barbara, quick. This is, a, this is a process question. We've put a bunch of issues out here, and you're talking with, about working with them. The, the question is, looks like my identity is falling on the floor. A fallen woman. <laughs> a fallen, no, no. No, no. Sorry. <laughs> That's, um, I, I wanted to, to, to come back to, to the, the dialogues. I mean, we, we have a lot of mechanisms in place. Thank you. <laughs> No, I'm upside down. Quickly, quickly <laughs> Just, restored, Barbara. Um, uh, uh, dialogues. <laughs> I'm talking now government to government, but there are a lot of business to business ones, and and in other arenas too, cultural, yeah, sure. etc., going on. Um, the the uh, economic strategic strategic and economic dialogue, which started under the Bush administration as economic and then was expanded right. to include strategic under Obama. I think these kinds of mechanisms um, are very useful, even if they don't seem to make as much progress as we would like. And perhaps our Chinese friends would say the same thing. <laughs> we, we, we're, we're sort of inching forward. But I think they're terribly important to keep going and they should be, we have so many of, of these other things besides the big one. There's JCCT, but there, there's something like 50 of these kinds of dialogues going on, government to government, and that doesn't even count the business to business, US China Business Council, Chamber, whoever. I think this stuff is really important. And what I have seen over the years is even though we, we kind of keep repeating what our issues are, our Chinese friends do the same thing, things happen. Uh, seeds are planted, and it doesn't seem as fast as we would like, but, but things happen. And to go back to the patience point that Hank was making, I think there is patience here, but we, we want to keep being assertive, but we need patience, and we need to, to begin to, to see, never to take our eye off where we're really trying to go, and we've got to just always keep talking. That's so, so terribly we have a new, important. So, so Barbara's proposed a new doctrine, call it <laughs> 
patient assertiveness or assertive right. patience. There you go. And so we have a new doctrine coming out of this meeting. Keep talking. Unfortunately, yes. we only have five more minutes. I've been informed we have to clear out at 240. This is security for Secretary Clinton's coming. We're going to have to go out up, up that way. So we've only got five more minutes. Um, I want to ask a specific question and then maybe get one round on another broad question. Um, Carla would really, really be disappointed if I never mentioned the exchange rate. <laughs> so I want to do it in the following way and make it a policy question. Governor Romney has said that on his first day in office, he would declare China a currency manipulator, which under the law means we would begin a negotiation with China on currency. I'm going to ask each of the panelists for a one-word response. Good idea or bad idea? Nick. Bad. Bob. As you know, Fred, the State <laughs> Department. <laughs> one word. One word. The word is the State Department, as Fred will remind me repeatedly, does not come in on currency issues. From my Treasury days. From his Treasury days. So I follow Fred's instructions to the letter. Hey, bad. Barbara. Bad. We'll have to have a word with Governor Romney, won't we? I'll shock you all. <laughs> I'll say good, but you all talk with Governor Romney. Now, final question. Uh, and we're unfortunately not going to have time for the audience. I thought we would, but we have to clear up. But I want to ask one question to each of you about the global relationship between the two countries, how they relate to the world as a whole. Barbara began to talk about that just now. Barbara was talking about that, too. How do you see the U.S. and China relating in their increasing responsibility, I would argue, to cooperatively manage the world economy? Do we have a G2? Do we need a G2? How would you go about it? And let me start from the end with Nick. Um, I don't think we have a G2, and I don't, I don't think we need a G2, but I, I would say that we are cooperating more and more. I think China's playing a very constructive role in the G20. China has bought into the WTO and particularly the dispute settlement process. I mean, they don't complain when we take them to dispute settlement, and when they lose a case, they actually comply, which is a lot better than you can say for the United States in many cases. So I think they have bought into a lot of the structures. We have a lot of common interests, but I think for the reasons that, were, that uh, maybe Ambassador Roy or somebody earlier this morning mentioned, the, the, the G2 concept isn't really quite right. Yes, we do need to work together but, uh, to make progress on a range of global issues, but it shouldn't be in such a formal structure. Bob? Yeah, we don't have a G2, and I don't think we want to have a G2. Uh, the U.S. and China are the two biggest economies, and Almost anything we want to do in the global economy uh, will depend on our working together. If we work at cross purposes, progress on most issues will simply be very difficult, if not impossible. On the other hand, to make real changes in the global economy, you need a lot of other countries. That's why there is a G20 and many other groups. And you need to bring in not only the BRICS, but as we're doing in East Asia as a result, and I'm sure Secretary Clinton will talk about this, through uh, APEC, through our greater cooperation with ASEAN, uh, through the TPP, and many other uh, institutions. And Barbara's talked about the importance of, of, of international institutions. I think you need to have a lot of countries engaged in changing the global economy. China and the U.S. may be the most important, but they're not, they're not the only ones. And if we tried to convey the notion to the rest of the world that deals were made between the United States and China, that we were then going to push on the rest of the world and have them accept those, I think the rest of the world would be, un would be resentful and understandably so. Hank, would your call for a U.S.-China free trade agreement move us in the desired direction, call it a G2 or not, but would it help with the global systemic management? I think, first of all, it'll take many years to negotiate, but that's good, that's not bad. Uh, I think we ought to have a free trade agreement with ASEAN. Uh, China's had one with them for over 10 years. Uh, we used to be the largest um, investor in the region. We're no longer that. Trade has increased with, with the ASEANs and China. Uh, we're way behind. But I think to have a G2 would be wrong. They view us, they view that, that we were just lecturing to them. And I think that's the wrong way. Barbara? Um, I'm not for G2. I'm for constant consultation. And that would mean 
president to president. It would mean all the way down. One of the things that I learned from President Bush 41 is that this was his instinctive way of, of, of acting. He would be always consulting with, with other heads of state. And I think that the example of that filtered down to the rest of us who were at the next level. I would, would want consultation top to top, but then push it right down through the system so that there's constant talking all the time. And I, I think this is, not, this is not what we're used to doing. We are not used to consulting that broadly um, with another country such as China. And I don't think China's used to doing it either. We're both used to unilaterally doing what we're doing. And so that's where I would come out. More consultation. Just to be clear, what I've been proposing at G2 for about seven years now, I have met informal, unannounced, even denied. I follow the Nike ad. I follow the Nike ad. Just do it. Don't talk about it. Just do, do it. it, and includes, of course, constant consultation. Um, and when Bob says, and I think he's right, nothing really happens unless the U.S. and China agrees, that's the case for a G2, not to supplement or sub substitute for the G20 or the IMF or anybody else, but unless the two can get together within those groups, those groups demonstrably don't achieve much, and that's what I mean by a G2. So we've got two takeaways today. One is constant consultation. Sounds good. Sounds right. I think we all support it. The other is patient assertiveness or assertive patience. Both, I think, are key guidelines to future U.S.-China economic relations. I want to thank both the Nixon Foundation and the Institute of Peace for sponsoring this panel. I want to thank Dwight for his very nice introductory remarks. I want to particularly thank the panelists for sharing their wisdom with us. Thank